Looks like the countdown's up. It's time to get started. Just trying to sneak in some, uh, <laughs> setting up some credentials for later uh, before the stream started. So give me one second. All right, so that should be good. Spoilers, there we go. All right, let's see, it's this one, right? There we go. Yeah, nothing secret there. Just a, a client ID, good. All right, so, good morning. All right, I uh, learned the other day power. <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, there's been a number of times where we've been trying to uh, do things that involve uh, credentials of various kinds. So that was just the time that uh, <laughs> the, the specific order of events got uh, confused. Yeah, it is a whole thing to make sure that uh, <laughs> I'm not putting things on the screen that I'm broadcasting that I don't intend to. All right, so today, um, as the stream title suggests, um, I mean, we're gonna come back to the Elixir, uh, go back to the, uh, the Elixir um, Twitch bot stuff. It's just not, I think, the most important thing right now, uh, which I think is this YouTube upload stuff um, in terms of the glowing telegram project, uh, which is th this thing right here. Uh, what did I think about the leak code stream? It was fun. Uh, the problem was, was that after the stream, <laughs> I was still thinking about those problems. Uh, in fact, was thinking about the uh, that first, the harder problem. <laughs> This morning, um, I saw a, a comment that was a pretty good hint about um, the relationship between like exactly K distinct integers versus uh, if you take uh, the number of sub arrays that have at most K minus the count of subarrays that have mo at most k minus one. And then that, so I have a, a solution in mind, like a, a, like a model of that. <laughs> I don't know if it's actually going to be more efficient to calculate the bits. There's probably some additional optimization within that. I need to, the point being that yes, uh, <laughs> the problem with that is, uh, I'm not gonna be able to stop until uh, I solve it to my satisfaction. And that is the danger. Um, XKCD uh, comes to mind there, the, the term nerd sniping uh, somewhat. So yeah, anyway. Too warm for the hoodie. I'll take that off. Okay, so um, I have, broadly speaking, a plan for what we're doing today. Uh, so I have this uh, issue in GitHub. This is, um, I think, I don't know if this project is actually visible um, to people. Like there's a project tab on the public repo for Glowing Telegram. Oh, it is private. Okay. Uh, I don't. I don't know that this needs to be private, honestly. Um, other than, <laughs> uh, other than, um, yeah, I'm not putting anything sensitive into it. Other than you know, people taking this as a promise of what's actually going to happen versus a brain dump. Uh, but I could make this public. I think. Manage access. Manage. Visibility. 
Okay, public, everyone on the internet has read access to this project. You can choose who has rights and admin access. Okay, cool, I did it. I'm, I'm, we don't have any collaborators yet, <laughs> but we could. Uh, so anyway, so yeah, so this is also, there's a draft PR, yeah, that I started working on the other day. And the bit that I, the bit that I had started working on is the, um, so let's take a couple steps back, right? So the whole point of Glowing Telegram as a project is to help me um, make it easier to take my YouTube or my, my Twitch streams and turn them into YouTube videos and do that sort of stream management stuff. And there's a, a bunch of other stuff I wanna cram into that, uh, doing AI stuff with it, generating descriptions from the, the transcript that's auto-generated. We've already done the transcription part, we just haven't done the, the AI part yet uh, in full. Although we do have like the, like the API hookups to do that, we just have not implemented it. Um, but anyway, so um, the thing that I have been working on and fine tuning, uh, let's pull the app up, it's over here, right? So we have episodes now. So I have a thing so you can select where the episodes break should be um, from the stream and then it will generate the episode records. Uh, I think I've so shown some of that on stream at some point. Uh, and then there's the export a TIO button. Uh, this generates a file that I can import into DaVinci Resolve uh, and it will grab the appropriate vid the video files from the local recording of the stream. And then um, I can fine tune it if I need to and um, it will spit out a, a, a rendered episode. Uh, so what I'd like to do is I could just go to YouTube and upload the file. Um, if you've not seen that before, um, I think this will be good context. Let's see. And there's nothing secret here. Let's see. Upload video. Let's see. If, what if I just edit one? Because that shows all the fields and stuff, right? So, like, here's the um, the last video I uploaded onto YouTube before I kind of paused doing that. Um, and there's a bunch of stuff that you fill in basically when you upload the the file. Ish. I mean, like, it's a multi-step process, but you, you dump in the file and then you can, um, uh, you get an opportunity to upload a thumbnail or select one from the video, select the playlist, say, uh, you know, if there's age restrictions, who the audience is, you know, clarifying, you know, various details, enabling or disabling features, uh, and adding tags, selecting the language, um, I stopped doing this. I used to put in a recording. I don't think that it really does anything. Uh, video location doesn't make sense for like this kind of content. The license, I recently switched to whenever I can using uh, Creative Commons, but you select all these things. You select uh, whether or not you want to publish to the subscriber feed, allowing short remixing, categorization, all, all of this stuff, and being able to set the, uh, the end screen uh, or any cards that should appear and like scheduling because you can schedule a video uh, instead of making it go live immediately. All, all of these things, right? So it's a lot of click this, click this, click this, uh, in addition to just like uploading a file. It's not just uploading a file. And so um, if you do that, especially I've, <laughs> the last time I went through, I had, um, you know, like several weeks, not so much worse, several weeks worth of live streams. And each of those is like three hours of video that I'm making into one hour episodes. So we're talking uh, 20 plus videos to do all that clicking in. And there's not a bulk process in the uh, YouTube UI for that. So um, that that's part of what's motivating this. And just that it feels like a complete piece of functionality if we can carry it all the way through the process. So having said all that, um, we are at the point now where I have the video file. I have a folder where I'm gonna have DaVinci Resolve dump the video files from now on. 
So we get a uh, renders folder. Let me do this. There we go. Power World Day 4 Episode 1. <laughs> right there. And uh, what I want to do, first and foremost, I want to be able to trigger the upload to YouTube from the UI here. Uh, in order to be able to do that, I need to link this episode record to that file. Um, and I could just have a text field and I could type it in, but ultimately what I want to do is I want to be able to go to like the episodes list and we're not going to do this right off the bat, but the, the idea would be, okay, I have all these episodes I've generated, uh, click a button to upload all of them and do the right thing. So that's, that's kind of a, a later on goal. The, the approach that I've been taking with all of this is to really focus on doing things piecemeal to figure out how to make them work, right? So like with the, um, the streams, also this UI has changed by the way, uh, a little bit. I added a little calendar overview so I can see which days I have stream records. This is very useful for going back and uh, uh, making sure that all the streams uh, this year are, are uh, in here. And then um, another thing I implemented since the last time we looked at this was a Twitch import. Oh good, this still works. <laughs> so this is the current stream right now uh, that we don't have uh, a thumbnail for quite yet. But yes, so this actually goes out to Twitch and pulls the list of um, videos VODs, uh, whatever. And it actually has infinite scrolls, so it'll keep on fetching until, yeah, this is this is how much Twitch remembers. This is how I got most of the, most of the, well, like the last uh, almost two months of streams into this tool, so that I didn't have to manually enter them, because what I did was I implemented an import. So now, from now on, at least, so later down the road, I do want to make it so that Instead of using the, uh, the Twitch um, stream manager, I will use this tool to kind of set up streams. And so the streams will actually get created here first. Um, and that will like sync to Twitch versus the, the interim solution, which is like after the stream today, what I'll go in here, what I'll do is I'll uh, go here. The thumbnail will actually pop be populated. The duration will be correct. I'll click this and I'll click import and that will create a, uh, a stream record. Um, and then to carry on the thought though, right? So the, the, the things are kind of piecemeal and that, okay, well I can go into a stream and I can go into the audio. Uh, it takes a second to load. We may want to look at some performance optimizations. So this one we have not uh, loaded the, um, we've not done the silence detection yet. So we, would, we could trigger that. It would, you know, do a background job. We could get a, uh, a list of like where the silences were. So we can select, we could click uh, start bulk create episodes that goes off and very quickly creates probably like three episodes like this. Uh, so all of these things are things that we could probably make a UI that like strings all the stuff together in one thing. Uh, you click one button, it does all the things. Uh, and then maybe like pings you like, you know, hey, you need to do this thing to select the stuff. Or we have like a bulk process thing where you're processing multiple, you know, there's lots of different things we could do, but it's kind of pointless to worry about streamlining the process if the process doesn't work, right? So getting, <laughs> taking care of like, can we actually detect silences? Can we generate the transcript? Can we, um, can we generate an export file to import in DaVinci Resolve? Can we upload the file to YouTube? Can we do all the fundamental things? And then all that's left is kind of wiring those things together and figuring out how best to present the workflow. Um, that is probably not the best way to do product design. <laughs> um, 
you would probably want to go the other way, figure out how the workflow should work and figure out something that makes sense. The difference is, is this is a tool for me. So if I can't figure that out, I still have the individual pieces and this will still be preferable to what the workflow look, looks like to do manually. Uh, and so I think I will be happy. And if I'm not, I will work harder <laughs> at making it, ma making a thing that will make me happy. Um, and maybe that is a good way to do product design if you are the target audience. Uh, anyway, so that was a long <laughs> explanation, uh, a long path to get us to the point where we can actually uh, talk about what we're doing right now, which is uh, first we have to link the file to the episode. <laughs> um, and I did do a little bit of work on this yesterday around making an API in Rust to scan for files in the renders folder. Um, let's see, whoops, that is control B. How about control P? Uh, things not to do, Don't, do not open the .env file on stream. Uh, so we have stream ingestion API, which we had before. Stream ingestion API previously had an endpoint called find files. Uh, in retrospect, we could be more specific, but instead I leaned into it and I made a separate endpoint called find rendered episode files. Uh, and then I extracted out the common bit, which is this get entries that basically does the scanning of a folder. Um, I think we wrote this on stream, but we're uh, using a Tokyo FS3 DIR and then we are going across the entries and we're saying, is it a file? If it is, and then we're using FF uh, probe to uh, scan the file and get a bunch of metadata. And then we're returning the, those accumulated entries. Uh, so file, uh, find rendered episode files does basically the same thing, but it um, is looking in a different, different folder, which is where that those rendered files go. And that's the difference. Does this need to be a separate endpoint? Maybe not. Maybe that should be like a single endpoint and then it has a parameter. Uh, that could be a thing we could do, but uh, I don't think I, I care all that much. I'm just get, going to do it that way. Okay, so that's where we're at so far. And then we're gonna we're gonna probably start here. Well, <laughs> the, the explanation of what we're gonna do is here. So um, this was kind of like, okay, well, what is the UI going to look like? How is this going to work? And for for now, what we're going to do is we're going to be able to go into the um, uh, into the episode record, and there's going to be some UI element that we can click that is going to trigger the uh, find rendered episode files endpoint to get the list. Now we could do caching and stuff on that endpoint, or do caching in the front end if we wanted to. I don't think it matters right now um, because I'm the only user. Uh, so <laughs> we'll leave that, uh, you know, for it's a, it's a future us problem. So I have some kind of UI element. I'm imagining this is going to be some kind of a button. You click the button, um, or it's going to be maybe like a disabled text field because it'll have like a URI slash file name in it. And then I'll have a button. You click the button. This will be like, um, this looks like a file upload thing, right? So it has like a, the name of the file and then a, a browse button, except this will open a dialog. Uh, it will show a loading thing. It will call the, the backend endpoint. Uh, that will return a list. We will select one of the entries from the lists uh, and hit OK or we'll hit cancel. That will update the field, the text value. Uh, and all of this needs to integrate with it needs to be like a React admin input so that um, that information is synced directly into the record that we're editing. And so that will update the, we'll then be able to save if we made any changes. Um, so to make all that happen, we need some other stuff behind the scenes, right? Because we actually need a column in the database in the, the, the episodes table for that value to go into. Uh, and this is where we, here, here's the plan, right? So we need that. We need to update our APIs from the in, in the CRUD API uh, microservice to uh, get the render UI from the database 
and take the, the render uh, UI from uh, the API call and put it in the database. Uh, so like backend stuff basically. And then we need to either probably just add a new endpoint, a uh, no, new method to the data provider um, in our front end to use the right API URL. Um, and then uh, the rest of the owl. <laughs> so we'll actually build this media picker input, um, which will be the kind of the glue to React Admin uh, and to the data provider. And then under that will be our media picker, I guess I'll call it that media picker, media picker dialogue, something like that, that will be the actual dialogue. Uh, and for now, we're going to be using Material UI because that's what everything is using. I did add something to the project plan recently. Um, I, I've seen a couple of blog posts. I think one was a thing linked from the React Admin docs about switching out the, uh, the UI library. Uh, also seeing more things that um, make me want to try out Tailwind. I don't know if I want to try out Tailwind in the context of this project but I am interested in, you know, possibilities. <laughs> so we'll see, we'll see. Um, okay. So, how about we do stuff? So the first thing we need is we need migration. I have a task, uh, diesel migration generate. And then we just need a name and it needs to not have spaces in it. Um, and the purpose of this is going to be to add the render UI to the episode table. So we'll call them the migration add <laughs> render uh, URI to episodes. Like I could say something longer, like add a render UI, uh, URI feed column to the episodes table, but nah then it prompts me for like which subfolder, which project to run that command inside of. Um, theoretically, we could have migrations in, in multiple things. Uh, I'm not doing that because that's that's gonna cause problems. And let, well, the thing is, is that we could do that. The other thing is that with this kind of project structure where we have these different microservices, what we would do if we needed to have a database for some of these services, which fortunately we've avoided that, right? So we have a shared folders like um, volumes for like bulk data for like videos and audio and stuff. But in terms of the, there isn't really shared data between the microservices because you don't want to do that. Um, if we needed a database for, for a service, uh, well, we do have, we are using Redis in some places. Um, and that Redis instance is, are we, are we sharing keys between microservices? I don't think we are. Anyway, you don't want to, like we could have a separate database, separate sets of tables for different microservices. It's kind of the thing to do with that rather than having, rather than passing state between microservices <laughs> outside of API calls. Okay. So, um, I'm gonna just like alter, alter uh, table episodes, add column render URI. Now, it could be text, right? We could have something very long. I think, how long can a varchar be? in uh, Postgres. Let's ignore that. I guess I, I m must have saved the file at some point. Uh, PG Varcher. Yep. Of course, text gives us unlimited length. Strings of any length. Is there a downside? Is there a downside to using text? The 
has a few extra CPU cycles to check the length when storing into a length constrained column. While Character N has performance advantages in some of the database systems, there's no, no advantage in Postgres. In fact, Character N is usually the slowest. In most situations, text or a character varying should be used instead. Yeah, character varying is uh, <laughs> Varshar is an alias for character varying. That gives us a limit. I don't. It's it's unlikely that the values that we are going to be generating right now are going to be more than some arbitrary limit. But I don't know why we would introduce an arbitrary limit here to the length of the URI. So my my inclination and habit is to use a varchar of like 255 or something, um, which I think probably comes from uh, trauma from other databases. So let's say for now, we're just going to go with text. Okay. And then of course, if we do an up migration, we also have to do it down. Yep. And uh, then we can apply it with a diesel migration run. And we just have to tell it which uh, service to run it in. So which folder to CD into, uh, and it's done. All right, so that's, this is done. Uh, except I've, I've, I've already failed uh, <laughs> because uh, this was supposed to be, is it nullable by default? Like if we don't say not nullable, is it nullable? Something I don't know off the top of my head because uh, I foolishly just accepted what Copilot gave me instead of actually thinking about what it was doing. Uh, probably shouldn't do that. Hmm. Um. on that screen, huh? Sure. It's a small too. All right, I probably... Mm, excuse me. Okay. I think I probably have had everything zoomed out. Okay, I can, I can zoom out further. How do I zoom in? Not like that. Reset layout. Nah. Preferences. See, in other things, uh, control equals seems to do it. Is there a yeah, keyboard shortcuts? Um. Well, I guess we're. <laughs> <laughs> it's not listed there. Uh, and like control scroll wheels do, does nothing. Ah, there we go. We can at least set it back to default with control zero. Uh, I think this is just like a, um, uh, a, whatchamacallit, Electron app, something like that. It's a web browser wrapping a, a web UI. Uh, right, so what I wanted to know was the episodes table. Is the column I just added nullable or not? So I just added rendered, rendered URI. If we go to SQL, um, I think it must be, actually the easiest thing to do, right, would be just to right click here and then view data, right? Because we didn't give it a default. So if it was not nullable, that would have failed when we added the column because, of course, the table didn't have existing values there. Cool. Okay. Well, that's fine. Just fine. 
we we accidentally got well, what I wanted. <laughs> uh, of course, episodes are going to start and they're not going to have a rendered uh, video file for them yet because that's that's not how the workflow works. Uh, I decided. Uh, so I'm just going to remove things from the from the list as we progress. Uh, so the next thing, let's do some Rust. In CRUD API. Uh, in now there's four things. Uh, <laughs> I did add some stuff for topics because I was getting tired of those uh, errors. Although one thing I, I decided that I was going to do is, um, and we, we've not set up the UI for it, but the the model is going to be that episodes link to a series. I think. I don't know. I have. That, that was the thought, right? And then the series would have topics. I think maybe the episode sh should potentially link, to the, the topics are like tags, right? So they can add detail about like the context of, of what they're about, um, which could be useful. Uh, I guess what I need to do is I need to add another many to many field to relate topics to, to episodes. Yeah. And then at some point I need to figure out how to actually like um, have the API pull that information <laughs> in the query and return it so that so that stuff can actually show up in the UI. I've not done that, but we have like the ability to list and create topics now um, for for that. Uh, what am I doing? Episodes. Yeah. So um, we don't need to support. So create, how it works is it takes in a create episode request. So it's a separate struct that represents the payload for episode creation versus the one for update. There's an update episode request struct that we'll need to modify. And then um, we're not, I don't think we need to have the render URI returned in the get list. So like, listing the records that uses the episode simple view struct to represent the subset of fields that we want to return in the list view. Whereas get one to get a single record, which is what we see in the, uh, oh, I must have minimized the browser. What we see in the, uh, the edit episode view that doesn't work right now, um, is the episode detail view. Uh, which is all, all of this is in structs for, for good or ill. So um, basically to do this, we need to edit episode detail view and update episode request. These two structs to have our field. Um, and then we have implementations of from for this one. And then we'll have to modify um, this. Although, uh, update episode change set from body. What is that? interesting? I wonder what it would look like if we could, I wonder if there's a way in which we could do this kind of similar from thing for thing to represent creating the update <laughs> as well. That could be really interesting. What, I, what I've been trying to figure out how to do is more and more like s make it so that the individual handlers here uh, are all the same uh, and they don't need to know specifics about the tables so that we could essentially reuse the overall um, like update record logic, right? And then the differences would all be implemented in uh, implementation of these traits for things. So that's a thing uh, to refactor at some point. Um, you know, we're, we're getting to the point now where we have like four different record types and there are going to be a few more. Uh, so this is a, as I learn more rust and think more about the problem, uh, maybe something will occur to me. Okay, so anyway, 
episode detail view, we do need a um, uh, render URI. Pub. Nope. Render. <laughs> uh, URI. And uh, yeah, this will be an optional string because we may have a string or we may, it may be null. And if it's null, we'll get a, a none here. A N O N E. Uh, and then now we get an error because our, our from episode for episode detail view uh, is missing something. Uh, I've made a mistake already because this should be URI. I decided. There we go. Um, are we happy with that? No. Let's see, episode. Okay, right. So this is the other thing. So the models file. So there are two files kind of um, that you get. Um, yeah, I think it generates something, although maybe it's empty. Uh, <laughs> there are two things when you set up diesel, right? There's a schema.rs. This is automatically, uh, automatically generated. So like when we look at episodes, there is a render URI here. Um, and then there's a, a um, where is episode coming from? There we go. A model starter RS. And this one isn't automatically generated because we want to be able to, um, maybe use certain fields to tell it like, oh, well, whatever you're getting should be convertible into this chrono naive date time. Uh, what you're getting from the database. And there's some stuff behind the scenes that can do the conversion for us. Uh, so for episode, what we're gonna do is we're gonna add, hey, render URI, and that's also option string. So now when we go back here, that error goes away because these types are compatible. And that just flows through. Uh, so we have that for the detail view. So that's gonna be for um, getting results back uh, to, to see in the UI on the edit view, and then to be able to actually update episode to add it, we also need uh, a render URI here. There we go. And uh, it should, all, all of the things here should be optional um, because we are saying like the front ends, the front end could send if it just only wants to update one field, it could just send the struct with everything else being none and the rend render URI being populated uh, is what we're saying. Of course, one aspect of that is I guess that makes it impossible to clear to 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 uh, to clear the render URI once you've populated it. Hmm, which is an interesting thought. That doesn't matter if we make the UI so that you, when you select a file, <laughs> you can't unselect. Um, yeah, yeah, once you selected something and it's saved and you go back to the record, you click the button again, the dialog pops up you can only select a different file. You can't unselect. I guess the implication of that is that that means our list of files should have a radio button <laughs> to, to select one. I mean, checkboxes wouldn't work anyway, uh, or it wouldn't make as much sense. Uh, yeah, anyway, okay. So I, I have a, a a more resolved picture of what this UI is going to look like. It could just be a drop down, right? We could just have a drop down, but that gets kind of awkward, especially if there's a lot of files, because then you might have to uh, scroll in a little drop down box for it. Okay, so um, focusing back on what we're doing here, we have uh, this and the other. 
Um, and so, right, so we need to update this to populate update episode change set. Well, I was really hoping it would, there we go. Uh, and that then in turn needs to be updated. There we go. So the, the body here that we're getting is an update episode request, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. Interesting. One, two, three, four. So are we missing things? <laughs> are we missing things that are supposed to be in there? Oh, I see control W doesn't work right now. Uh, so yeah, so something that I discovered at least the other day, you don't need to see that. Uh, the, the reason my control W was not working was because, uh, let's see, how about, there we go. Okay. It's the Samsung Magician, when it wants to do an update, somehow intercepts across the entire operating system, control W. Uh, so opening and dismissing the update re request message, I guess I could also update, but that was troublesome. Uh, seemed to fix it. Anyway, some Googling eventually turned up. <laughs> that uh, is why my control W was not working. It was very confusing. Uh, anyway, what was I doing? Oh yeah, I was wondering why we're not populating the other things. Now, part of this is because we're not prompted to, right? Because although the body, the update episode request struct is driving, um, is, well, is saying what is allowed in the request body. What's driving what we need to populate here is this struct, the change set that gets, you know, sent to the, the database uh, query to update. Uh, and so there's no connection right between the struct and the struct that would say, Oh, well, there are fields in uh, the body that we're not using. Uh, should we be probably like thumbnail URL and tracks? Are those the what's missing? Yeah. Uh, for episode. That's interesting. We wouldn't have noticed this. Well, at least for tracks, there's not a way in the, I don't know, but anyway, that this should probably be there. And then, uh, yeah, I probably should just do it here first. There we go. And, uh, what's the other one? I already said it, but I've already, I've already forgotten thumbnail URL. Hub thumbnail is optional. I do enjoy the random errors. These things will, yeah, there you go. Takes a little, little bit of time. Proc macros and our build scripts have changed and need to be rebuilt. Okay. Uh, rebuild. Does that make you happy? Missing structure fields thumbnail URL, but it's not, it's right there. This is wrong though. Uh, right, so we have vec track. What happens if we do vec track here? It doesn't know what a track is. Or does it? Uh, let's see. Right, so the underlying table for episode, it has tracks, but it's it's supposed to be, uh, it's just JSON. 
So uh, this needs to be like this. I'll make that happy. And this unhappy. <laughs> uh, so I think we need to like JSON encode tracks in some way. Uh, we could probably do something like match. There we go. Copilot giving us some code that might work. I mean, it is the option of vectors of tracks. All right. So this is um, <laughs> this has confused me a couple times, but it, it's it, the the first message is pretty important. Uh, it doesn't like us overriding the name here, like shadowing it, I guess. And otherwise, it's fine. Um, I don't like this unwrap being here. It. Yeah, what if. Could we just do this? No, because this is a result, not an option. I think what we should do probably then is move this out. So again, it tries this. It, it the the suggestions want us to try to unwrap, and that is. Um, not a thing we want to do because that will cause a panic and then we won't be able to control the kind of error it'll just crash the server uh, as I think is is I think what's going to happen if we do that um, rather than returning an error to the client so if we if we do this we can do the right thing and then we just also want to match uh, to can we parse tracks uh, or not parse but can we um, uh, serialize, which is fun to think about, right? Because effectively what we're doing here is we're, we're, we're deserializing tracks via the stuff up here, right? In the incoming request. And then we have to serialize it again. And we're handling the case where somehow we failed to serialize, um, the value back to JSON somehow. Uh, kind of unlikely, but, and then we have the same error where this needs to be, um, actual tracks. I don't know. Why can't we shadow that value? I'm sure there's a very good reason. Okay. So tracks now is... Uh, okay, so if we Right, so this this needs to cover a case where we got something other than um, Wait, what which case are we not where are we missing here non exist a non-exhaustive pattern some underscore and none not covered What do you mean? What do you mean where? Um And then we have, oh, errors from other files? Mismatch types, expected enum, option, found struct tracks. Oh, right, now we're, now we're shadowing columns tracks. Okay, cool. Uh, sure. That make it happier is that the real cause of the problem yeah that's the real cause of the problem <laughs> is that uh tracks is already something we're, we're using schema episodes dsl star and that has like all of the different column names from the table so that we can refer to them here 
I have mixed feelings about that, but we did it. Okay, so now we uh, not only can update the render URI, but these other fields too. Uh, and we can retrieve it. So that's the back end done from our list. Update the API to return and accept. So that's done. Uh, and then the data provider. So data provider. Um, and we have, so side note, one thing that I did do um, uh, for the Twitch import, um, I really wanted to just use the React admin list view to list out kind of the, the data of the past streams for the Twitch import, uh, Twitch stream import. And really the only good way of doing that is to make it so that the data provider can um, act on the Twitch import uh, resource and do like retrieve the data. And I, I did look at proxying in Nginx um, the endpoint in my Twitch API microservice to make it look like the CRUD API endpoints, specifically around listing. The issue is, is there's a bunch of behavior that simple REST data provider expects uh, in terms of pagination and stuff that just doesn't work with the uh, the way the Twitch API works for retrieving streams. It's like a, uh, it has a cursor. And so I, I have a really hacky uh, data provider that just only supports getting uh, Twitch videos via my API. Uh, it has just some internal state. Uh, so when you call it and you call get list, you pass a page number and it says, oh, if you want the pay, if you want the first page, it just makes the request. And then if you make any subsequent requests for the next page, it just says, Oh, the, pre the previous cursor that was returned from the previous page was this. So I'll include that cursor in the request. Um, so this is not exactly the same. I, I think the parameters also call it after in the actual Twitch API. Um, but this is calling my local microservice that wraps that. And, but basically mirrors the, the behavior. Technically, I guess I could have in my wrapped API hidden this there. Uh, I don't think that matters. Um, and it, it works for my very limited use case of fetching a couple of pages of data to dump into the UI to select some and import it. And then I, I will come back later and it will fetch everything all over again. Uh, that's fine. Uh, and so what I ended up doing though, was I discovered um, in react admin, there's a combined data providers function uh, that you pass in uh, basically a dispatch function that says, oh, uh, in this case, what I'm doing is I'm doing a switch. If the resource is Twitch streams, I return this provider. Otherwise, I return the one I've been using this whole time that is the simple REST data provider. So that's that. Uh, but what we, want to, what we want to do right now, why is there no space there? That's odd. When did that happen? <laughs> uh, hold on. So we're, we're calling Q stream transcription, right? Yeah, not async. Okay, cool, 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 cool. All right. Uh, so what we're trying to do now, though, is we have something. Didn't we have something that called um, the other find files? Endpoint. Or did we not? Oh, there it is. Get stream clips. There we go. Um, I could just like the same thing with the API, right? I could have made the API take a parameter. I could make this method take a parameter. Uh, instead, I'm just going to make a separate method. Um, they are different use cases. There we go. Get rendered episode files. Um, something like this. There aren't any arguments to it. Uh, you can pass a prefix, but we don't need that. That was kind of just a, 
I included it because I already had the code for it. Um, I think that's it. Get rendered episode files. It calls our API, uh, the path to the particular microservice, that particular uh, uh, route. Uh, with no parameters, it gets the results, it returns it back. That's it. All right, so uh, thus concludes everything except for the actual UI. So we're gonna take a little break here um, because I need to go uh, fill up my water because the coffee's done with, uh, stretch my legs, uh, all of that stuff. When we come back, we're gonna do some UI stuff. Uh, I think probably what I'll do is we'll start with the media picker component, kind of the internal non-React admin thing. Uh, I'll fire up Storybook and we'll make a, a story as well. So we can just work on that in isolation. Then we'll come back and build the media picker input that'll wrap that and integrate it to our data provider and React admin. Uh, and then this error will go away. All right, I'll be back in just a few minutes with some more coding on Glowing Telegram, it's an open source project, BRB.